but yes, the, the title of the talk today is How Can Our Language and Behaviour Be More Inclusive? Um, and there are two content warnings associated with the talk around harassment and suicide. Um, if either of these are subjects that um, affect people around you and it's just a bit too close to home um, at this point in your life or previously, um, I would strongly recommend that you perhaps attend another talk. At any point, if you want to leave, that's, that's entirely fine. Nobody will be offended. And if you see somebody wanting to leave, please just help them or get out of the way so that they can do that as quickly and easily as possible. At this point, before we get started, I would like to introduce my new best friend, ah. who is going to share with us why he's here today. You, you all heard that. He said best friend, right? OK, Very my name friend. is Luis. Um, I was tricked in here because he posted something on the Utah JS Slack. He said, are you a minority in code? Right now he's saying that something else like, are you a minority and you're willing to present and ridicule yourself on stage? <laughs> so here I am. Um, I, I don't know what the talk exactly is going to be. He said, you say your name, say where you're here. Well, I'm here to learn. Um, but he's going to talk about being a little more inclusive. So I'm going to tell you a story. I have a job and I almost lost that job because I interviewed with a technical guy and a business guy. And later I found out that two weeks, for two weeks I didn't hear about the job. And the reason for that is that the business partner considered that I did not know enough English to get the job. Uh, so they went through a lot of candidates and eventually came down to a coding challenge. And that's why I got the job and I've been there for two years now, almost. So um, there, there is some of it in the industry. Hopefully we're going to hear about that here. So, Luis, nice to meet you all. Thank you. So, as Dave mentioned, uh, I work at a company called Litmus, and I don't know if you can see the name there. Um, we build a, a creative email platform which allows you to teach uh, email designers and developers and allows them to build their email and test it in a multitude of ways that I had never ever considered. Um, I, I look after an organized Scotland GS and Scotland CSS. If anybody wants to come and visit, they will be held sort of late June time, early July next year. And so why do I want to be talking about inclusivity and language and behavior? Um, it's, it's very strange to let's see how this is going to work. So where did I got to? Um, I've got a sort of long history of uh, agile and extreme programming development uh, and coaching experience and to find ourselves just over the mountain from Snowbird where the <coughs> excuse me, agile manifesto was put together, it just seems really nice. And in terms of my coaching experience, I was always the first to preach that first principle right at the top. You know, people over process. People are, the, are what makes software, as Emily mentioned earlier. It's, it's down to all of us. So the, the success of projects is because of us. And also, usually, if things don't go so well, that's also down to us, too. <laughs> um, so um, th this sort of, after been developing for about 15 years at this point and having run the conferences for about three years, um, this lady, Lena Reinhardt, gave a talk at the conference, and this opened my eyes in terms of how other people are treated within the industry, and um, then how can we go about being more open and inclusive for um, people from underrepresented groups. And I suppose at this, this point, from then, then forward, I started learning a lot about this word privilege. And prior to that, my sort of experience of that outside dictionary definition was seeing people being very irate on Twitter, um, complaining about white male privilege. And a lot of the time, I was sort of taking this a bit to heart and thinking, but I've never met you, and why are you complaining about something I have no say in or have had nothing to do with? So what I would like to attempt to do is provide 
or give you a rough definition that sort of helps with this talk. It's not all encompassing, but privilege to me, my understanding of it is, is that we each have a way, a number of ways that we present to the world. So if you think of your ethnicity, your gender, your sexuality, your faith, are you able-bodied? So all of these things are, are a big part of your privilege. Um, but the other part of it is what society may grant or take away from you given those facets and attributes that you have. For example, um, as a white male developer, I presumably could do something rather horrible and I'm quite confident I could still get another job in a couple of months time. That's not the situation for everybody in this industry. Uh, as Lewis already explained his experience. So this talk is not so much geared towards the what you can do, although there is an aspect of that. It's more about why. Why should we be doing this? And it's very much about trying to put all of you into other people's shoes and try and gain an insight into their perspective um, and the various situations that they can find themselves in very regularly. So just to sort of set some context, again, we're all different, we're all individuals, we're all unique, but the kind of situations that people find themselves in and find themselves discriminated against to an extent, be that deliberate or some form of unconscious bias, um, we can essentially look at the graphic equalizer, which needs a really funky name for this. But you know, if we look at, say, if we treat the first bar as how racist, for example, you may be on a scale of like zero to 100%, everybody is gonna have a different level in the room of that. And the same applies to bigotry, homophobia, sexism, and the likes. I don't think I've got, I think I may have too many bars there. So everybody has their own unique sort of configuration that society has, has granted them. And there'll be an amount of that has, um, how, do, how do we describe it? You know, an amount of this will be imbued through your, your environment and what you've learned from perhaps parents, from school friends. If you have not, and your understanding may not have progressed beyond that with people of certain backgrounds because you never, your assumptions and your understanding has never been challenged by never having any experience to just be with these people. And you find that all of a sudden, actually, they're just like me. So what is it that excludes people? So I've got about five examples here. It's by no means exhaustive. Um, and I should also throw in that I am by no means an expert. This is pretty much what I've learned along the way and I'm trying to sort of help bring other folks up to speed with what I've discovered. Okay, doc. So, what I would like you to do is try and put yourselves in the positions of uh, the person or persons in our first example. Has anybody ever been in the situation? Oh, actually, I should wind back a little bit. All of our examples, apart from the last one, were sort of sourced from the Twitters. I asked what, how people were, what was it that made people feel excluded? And the first examples is um, an anonymized response that we got to that. So, um, do we all love JavaScript? Yeah. There we go, everybody. <laughs> But the gist is, um, which imagine yourself, wh whichever language, framework, or whatever it is that you develop with every day, and there's somebody continually sort of just chipping away and running it down. This is, this is what you do for a job. This is the technology that you use. And people are continually sort of prodding and prodding. You tend to also find that, you know, the more popular language, the more gripes there are about it. But the, the, the people that got in touch, 
Um, in this instance, there was there's a sort of local Slack community, and um, there was someone continually berating the technology that they used. And it got to the point that this was happening so frequently that they just disengaged. Uh, the, the next example um, is around computers, interestingly. So I would like you to try and imagine and put yourself in the shoes of uh, a woman um, who's uh, in a development role, has been doing it for a number of years, um, is very professional, um, is receiving plaudits from in every review that they get, and... Women should not be allowed near computers. And this is the kind of response, or not, not response, this is the outburst that is continually happening a number of times a week um, from just over the partition. As the sole woman developer in the office, continually, uh, nobody is standing up for her. All her friends and colleagues, everybody is just letting it go. She raises it with her superiors. We'll handle it, we'll handle it. There is no sort of change in behavior. And given the intimidating outburst from Brian, thank you, Brian. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, this isn't someone that you're gonna try and approach to resolve the issue, you know, um, given how angry and annoyed they seem to be. But everybody's still very, very happy with your work. It doesn't make sense, but nobody's standing up for you. So this continually chips away at your self-worth and your value in your contribution. Uh, you know, Emily was talking again about imposter syndrome earlier. You know, th so this is going to eat into the, the negative thoughts. The next example, um, I would like you to imagine that you're um, a woman in, say, a sort of web consultancy. Um, there's maybe about two dozen developers You've been working there for about nine years. This is maybe about three years more than anybody else in the, the development side of things. Uh, it's still a fairly small company, it's maybe about 30 people overall. And you are the linchpin in that company. If the business development people have um, any questions or queries about a new product a client has come along, want and built, or a new site, Business people come to you. If there's a tech issue or, or a question, people, how do you go about solving this problem? This code base we built a number of years ago. We've got to do some more work on it. How did you solve such and such? You are the person that they come to. Okay? So you're right there in the middle of it. And it's Monday morning. Directors are way out to fetch um, the new client who's coming in to visit. And uh, so everybody's gathering in the meeting room for this 10 a.m. meeting. Oops, how's this work? And uh, uh, the director brings in your new client. He's like, hey, right, everybody, I'd like you to introduce you to Bill. Bill's a new client. He's going to uh, explain what we're going to be doing for Project Whizbang and what it's all about. And Bill comes in, he's like, hey, folks. How are you all doing? It's a real pleasure to be here. Really looking forward to working with you all. And why are you here? Looking at yourself, the sole woman developer in the room. And it's like, you shouldn't be here just solely because you're a woman. How does that make you feel? So obviously there's an aspect of the client should have engaged his brain before opening his mouth. Um, but I quite like how April Wenzel, I would encourage everybody to follow April, um, who said, if you're about to say, you don't look like someone who would consider rejecting the stereotype and keeping an open mind. Okay. Again, this is something that's gonna be chipping away at somebody's self-worth, value and confidence Boot camp, our next example. Um, 
a number of people are coming through boot camps these days. They've become very, very popular. Um, in this instance, a uh, woman has just decided to change career and get into a boot camp uh, a couple of weeks in, really having a good time, really enjoying learning lots of new stuff. As um, you've, you've now went in and sat in a lab, you've got some work to be getting on with. Um, there's yourself and a number of classmates. And five young men walk into the room. They're a bit noisy, they're a bit boisterous. Um, they open their laptops, it gets rowdier. There's um, things start getting, the, the language starts getting somewhat inappropriate. Uh, they're pretty much discussing quite loudly. Um, can you send me over that photo? Can you send me that one? And then, you know, continue to, to go into great detail about what they would like to do to the semi-naked and naked women in the pictures that they're sharing. I think it took a tremendous amount of courage for, at this point for her to go up and approach those five people, because it must have been quite intimidating at the time, and explain to them, to, to even have to explain to them, that this is a professional environment, we're all here to learn, and really this is completely inappropriate. The response was, it's just a joke. I would like you to sort of note this one down, sort of mentally. This, I have come to understand, this is pretty much the, the cover your ass statement. You know you've upset someone, and it's how do I sort of quickly whitewash everything out and run away? How can I cover my tracks as quickly and easily as possible? Um, and since having that realization, um, there, there was an incident at home. Incident sounds a bit strong, but this is, this is what I said. And as soon as I said it, I realized I'm like, I, I don't understand why my partner Karen is upset but I know it's something that I've done, and so I need to then set about working out what is it that's, in particular, is it that's upset her, and how, why have I instigated that? So, in this situation, and we've actually got another number of examples around boundaries, um, But I think the key thing is that other people are setting the boundaries for what is appropriate and what isn't. And, and the woman in that situation isn't. And she's the vulnerable person. So if we have a look at this, which is quite terrifying reading, from the Rape Crisis Scotland website, the quote uh, pretty much says that one in three women worldwide have experienced either physical and or sexual intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence in their lifetime. One in three. So now, come back to that scenario. And even for people that are here today, th this must be a terrifying situation because all the other men in the room, or all the men in the room, are the people who are setting their own individual boundary and not telling you, and you don't know what it is. I think that must be a terrifying situation to be in. Our last example, um, this will take a while, again, just to highlight, this is going to dip into um, a large part of an example around suicide. Um, so again, if you would like to duck out, that's absolutely fine. So. At this point, could everybody stand up, please? So while you're doing that, um, I'll quickly explain a little bit about mental health. This is something that's a very sort of taboo subject in the UK. And uh, mental health is very much like physical health. And there's times when we have good physical health, we have poor physical health, then we're ill, and that's the time that we need to go to the doctor. Mental health is exactly the same. We have good mental health, poor mental health, and when we're ill, we need to go to the doctor. So to sort of demonstrate uh, the scale of the issue in society of mental uh, illness, um, I would ask you to sit down 
if you know anyone who suffers from depression. Could you sit down if you know anyone who self-harms? Uh, if you know anyone who suffers from panic attacks? Do you know anyone who has bipolar disorder? Um, do you know anyone who has attempted suicide? I think at this point we'll give up. <laughs> um, but thank you very much. We have one person left standing. Um, so, and we were very deliberate about saying, do you know anyone with, so that we're not explicitly outing anyone in particular. Um, so, given our context and we see how big a problem this is, um, yes, we're trying to, I'm trying to raise awareness around this next uh, example. So, let's see, this is, this is the uncomfortable part. So, to explain a little bit about suicide, I believe the number was 86% of people who attempt suicide, their goal and this seems really sort of strange phrase, is not to die. Their goal is to get themselves out of a situation that they're in, and it's just incredibly desperate, and they just want to escape from it, and this is the only way out. So something maybe to bear in mind when, if you find that you've got a friend or colleague who is in an incredibly sort of uh, depressed and down state, if all of a sudden you find that they have changed their behavior and they're all, all of a sudden quite a lot more upbeat, they have, their outlook and perception has changed quite dramatically in a, to the positive. Um, this could very well be because they have decided what they are going to do. They're getting things in order and they know how they are going to escape their situation. Um, something else about this is that well, in the UK, um, uh, pretty much are of every five people that attempt suicide, four are male, which is also a quite scary statistic. And this is put down to us not being very good at expressing ourselves and explaining our feelings and resolving issues. So at this point, I would like you to try and think of a horrible situation that would take you to the lowest point in your life. Is that something related to your children, maybe not being able to see them, maybe not being able to afford them or home them, or something else to do with your family? I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Okay. And then give a little bit of consideration and to what it is, how would you go about performing this act? So with that in mind, please bear that in mind for the, the rest of the example. So at some point you wake up in hospital over the next few months, your physical wounds heal. Your mental wounds and issues take longer to overcome. You may be working on that for a number of years. After a while, you finally make it back to your place of work. Um, maybe part-time, building it up slowly but surely. And at, at one point, your, your boss taps you in the shoulder, takes you aside for a little chat and says, we know you've been through an incredible amount. We don't really have much in the way of budget to support people going to, in terms of uh, keeping their skills up to date, but we would like to give you a, a small gesture of a reward, and that's to send you to this conference that you've been so eager to, to go to and learn about all the new technologies around whatever is your chosen topic of, uh, is that you do in your day job. <coughs> and, you know, to have somebody basically come and reward you and show that they have faith in you and they appreciate everything, not only what you've been through, but your contribution since. It just fills you with joy and you're absolutely beaming. So the day comes of the event, you're all excited, you're going along, there's all these wonderful speakers on that you're going to see, 
and hear from. There's all these wonderful new people that you're going to meet in the hallway track and chat to. And uh, you, there's, this, there's this new library that's just come out. And one, one of the speakers, one of the authors, is, is, is giving a talk. So you're straight in there into the talk. You've sat down, you've got your notepad out, all ready to go. And they start describing the library that they're working on. You know, hey, we're very excited to be here. And I'm here to tell you all about Library X. And, you know, it's really going to revolutionize how we do payments. And, uh, and he says, see, the first three months, the first three months of this program, or, or of this project, it was so incredibly dull. You might as well slit your wrists. And this was also accompanied with hand actions. At this point, what are you thinking? You're, you're currently trapped in a room, 300 people all around you. It's like a spotlight has been shone on you. And, and there, there's no way to get up and run out. There's not enough room, there's not enough space. Um, it's, it's like all of a sudden everybody in the room knows your secret and at the same time the, 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 the more terrifying thing is that with that single comment you're transported back to that point in your life I'm quite confident that wasn't the speaker's intention it was very much at, up to this point I would have considered that a throwaway remark but having spoken to one of the volunteers at the conference. Um, they were pretty much where I am, looking at the audience. And there was a large number of the audience were nonplussed. They, they didn't think anything of it. There was, there was a sizable amount as well that looked quite shocked. And there was a not insubstantial number of people, easily in double figures, that had a more terrified look on their face. So, what I would like you to think about is you, our words and our actions have an impact. And um, so our words and our actions can have a, an impact for people who this was affecting. We don't know at what stage were they having a very good day in terms of their mental health. Had they recovered to a large extent? Was this something they could shrug it off? Or were they still struggling? Is this something that could have a quite adverse effect? So, if we move on to the tips and advice section, in terms of trying to get a better understanding of different people from different backgrounds, the very easy, lightweight thing to do is follow people from different backgrounds on social media. The second item is, is a very sort of physical um, thing to do. Today, you know, in the hallway, um, you'll find people gather in little circles all the time. And for somebody else who doesn't know anybody, um, that could be quite intimidating. As somebody maybe coming along for the first time, that group there, that looks like they're all work colleagues. That group there, they all look like they're friends. I don't know anybody. I'm a bit of an outsider. Um, what have I got to contribute there? The, the imposter syndrome again. <laughs> um, so if you're the person in that circle, just do that. And all of a sudden, there's space at either side of you for people to join. It's so simple. And then, but then, are people going to be brave enough to come up and join? So, if somebody does, what I would suggest is introduce yourself. Because somebody's going to come along, they're not going to know what the subject matter is, they don't know anybody. If you introduce yourself, they introduce themselves. And something else that would be really good is if you give them a quick catch up on what the actual subject matter of the discussion is. 
it just, it just seems really simple, but it's going to bring that person in and they can start contributing. At the same time, if somebody's maybe hanging about the edges and sort of on their own, invite them in. They might not be comfortable to, in which case that's fine if they need their own space. Um, and again, introduce yourself, give them a quick catch-up. And the third example, quick reminder, is to call out an appropriate language and behaviour. So imagine you're in that group and someone says something inappropriate or derogatory. You could approach it in a way of pointing it out to them there and then in front of the group. Depending on the personalities involved, I can see that potentially going quite astray. Um, so, so what I would suggest doing is that if you, if you were to approach someone or, or call it out right there and then, the other person's going to get defensive, and that's because you've publicly shamed them. And then they'll get agitated and defensive and angry, and then they'll be shouting back at you, and then you will get defensive and agitated and angry and start shouting back at them. And you can see that this doesn't really progress. Nobody le um, learns anything from it. So what I would suggest is when discussion moves on, sort of approach them and say, hey, can you give me a hand with something? Or can we go for a chat? And when we're away from the group, ideally, explain to them, here, this is what you said. This is why it's derogatory, inappropriate, sexist, racist, whatever. Um, and ideally bring them round and they'll understand point you're making and why their behaviour is inappropriate. Ideally, at this point, if you're on the receiving end of this, the, the, the thing that I would think to do is to say thank you for somebody for raising, raising it, because they've approached you. That's not something they had to do. They're trying to help educate you. And at the same time, I would say that's quite a brave thing to be doing as well. And then there's the group in which you said or did whatever you did. It would be really good to take that knowledge back, apologise and explain why what you said or did was inappropriate. And that's helping share the knowledge around as well. At the same time, you might not be in a position to, when you're having that discussion, you might not be able to sort of understand the point that the person's making. You know, it's like, thanks for trying to explain this, but I'm not quite getting it. That seems, that seems reasonable enough. Um, is there, you know, maybe ask, is there another way you can explain this? Oh, I gave the slide beforehand. So, to, to backtrack a little bit, um, the, the, the BBC at home, who you may have heard of, um, I kind of view as, a, or my, my feelings are that it seems like a very sort of stuffy, sort of uh, curmudgeoned, sort of, uh, well, government-funded body. Um, and they have given Jodie Whittaker, um, an actress, uh, basically the, the lead role as playing an alien, Doctor Who, and the first, basically she's now the first female actress to play Doctor Who. And this for a stuffy company like the BBC seems a very forward thinking and big change in attitudes for them. So I would like to suggest that Given the, the, the examples and scenarios that we've been talking about, the throwaway remark about suicide, a lot of people tend to feel that this is my language and I shouldn't have to change it for anybody, or it's too hard to change. If the BBC can take a step forward like this, I would suggest that you can change some of the phrases that you use. Uh, this is a photograph from Sao Paulo Airport. Um, the airline industry, I'm sure they're advancing in many ways, but their offering still is very much take you from me and drop you a B. All going well. Um, nothing much has advanced. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's it, again, these people seem to be placing a lot of value in diversity. I think you should too. So the, the main aspect of what I'm trying to do today is give you a level of awareness uh, as to when should you be listening to other people and trying to understand their issues and how all of us 
myself included, um, we can be impacting them with our language and behaviour. And how can we then go about improving by being introspective and looking, for, looking to find out how and why we manage to upset people? So today I would like to come to the, just about the close and ask you as an individual, how can your language and behaviour be more inclusive? So I'd like you to take that away and think about that today. And just before closing, I would like to make a little announcement about a project that I've been working on. Uh, part of our sort of diversity outreach at Scotland GS and CSS last year, uh, we ran a number of diversity call for proposal workshops to help people from underrepresented groups and encourage them to apply to speak which was incredibly successful in terms of en encouraging people to submit text. <laughs> and so this worked very well for us. So could this not work for other events, other technology communities? And we, Peter had this idea of let's make it a global event, single day, February the 3rd, February, yeah, February 3rd, 2018. It will be open to people from all tech communities, even if they don't want to speak about a technology, technology subject, everybody's welcome to come along. And we launched on Thursday. At that point, we, had, we have a workshop in Edinburgh lined up, one in Glasgow, Sheffield, Bath, London, Dublin, Atlanta, New York, Boston, Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, Singapore, came online on Friday, Sydney, let's see, and what else? We've got a remote version. We have ones in the works, workshops in the works for Berlin, Oslo, Montevideo, Brussels, Reykjavik. This morning, we've got Bangalore and Zurich appeared out of nowhere. It's awesome. So this is happening on February the 3rd. If anybody, anyone would like to put on a workshop in their city, they're very welcome. We will supply all the materials. We'll, we'll leave you to do as little as possible to make this happen in your area. Should we have one in Salt Lake City or wherever your hometown is? If this is something you would like to find out more about, please just come and grab me afterwards. We can have a chat. If there's anything about the rest of my talk earlier, uh, given it's all quite sensitive, um, I would suggest grabbing me afterwards for a chat. If there's anything you'd like to ask about or speak about. Thank you very much for your time and attention, folks. <laughs>